Sun Certified Builders Cooperative has been around since 2012, but we've been learning about high performance buildings uh, as a family since the late 70s. Um, so we have some retrofit history in founding membership. In the late 80s, uh, my uncle Randy Proven had completed a Larson Tress retrofit to an older home in Plumas, Manitoba, uh, complete with a homemade HRV. Um, so he convinced my parents, who had just purchased some land and a farmhouse built in 1919, to move the farmhouse and retrofit it using the Larson Truss. Uh, that project started in 1993. This happened to be one year before the very first passive house project was certified in Darmstadt, Germany. Um, so I kind of compare and contrast. We were just learning about high performance buildings and retrofits. Uh, and I think passive house at that point was already decades ahead. Doing research into Canadian buildings, uh, establishing a methodology and systems for achieving uh, the energy re reduction goals that they had established. Now, if only we had had rural internet back then. Um, quickly in the images, the farmhouse project is in the upper left uh, and some more recent uh, urban retrofits are the surrounding Kildonan Drive on the lower left, the Strathcona Foundation in the center and 547 Montague or the full Monty, which we will discuss is on the left. So we use Passivos International to guide our design and construction. Uh, Passivos Institute certifies projects, components, and people. I'm a certified Passivos tradesperson and a certified Passivos consultant. Um, it's an international performance-based construction standard. Enerfit is the Passive House retrofit standard. And it's kind of interesting because it allows you to retrofit to different uh, levels similar to the regular passive house. And I think it's a, it's a worthy um, uh, standard to pursue. All the goals and performance metrics are verifiable, measurable and proven to perform with decades of performance data and millions of square meters of building in operation currently. Uh, passive house Institute is evolving to meet the challenges presented by catastrophic climate change and the adaptation necessary to meet those challenges. So we try to use proven building and climate change science to guide how we retrofit and build and Passive House um, seems to be one of the best available. So we're gonna very quickly run over those key principles uh, that is basic building science that fall into, under Passive House, thermal insulation, continuous high quality and low carbon, uh, passive house windows and doors. Um, these are high quality windows and doors that uh, typically are insulated and constructed a little bit differently than the ones in North America. Uh, interior comfort and condensation risk for passive house certified products are modeled in the energy model. Um, so you know that there's not going to be condensation forming and you know that there's not going to be cold spots. Um, we use local ducts and windows that may not meet passive house certification, but they represent excellent value, long-term performance, competitive price, they're local and they're interested in sustainable buildings or high performance buildings. Um, heat recovery ventilation has to be greater than 80 or 75% efficiency. Uh, one of the issues is many North American models barely qualify. Um, this situation is improving, but costs for efficient models has jumped considerably in the recent uh, few years. Air tightness is one of the key principles. We target the passive house standard of 0.6 air changes per hour at um, negative 50 or plus 50. Um, the method that we use can achieve the well below that target. So we feel confident in the method that we use, the tape the plywood. Thermal bridge-free construction, uh, your retrofit system has to address thermal bridges or it's not gonna be very successful. Uh, and not yet on this list um, is embodied carbon, uh, but they have a tool to, um, uh, to tally embodied carbon in the new modeling. So it's kind of interesting that way. Now, 
probably jumped to uh, thermalization. Anyway, that those five principles uh, applied to any building would get you a better building, but you have to set goals uh, so that you can have targets for each of these. So the retrofit method, as I indicated, it's, it must address these criteria. Uh, this particular image illustrates a lot of the uh, issues that we I just discussed. Uh, poor quality insulation, typical framing, thermal bridges, inadequate ventilation, and that means you have to have a fairly large heat supply. Uh, at the time that we did this retrofit, those windows were high performance uh, windows that had been installed into the building about 12 years prior, but that install did little to address moisture production at the bottom of the unit from in-wall and surface condensation. Um, we don't know because the owner couldn't recall, but there may have been grant money involved in that installation. So on the left, uh, the image we've tried to upgrade the old wall insulation with well-fitted rock wool. We're adding our diffusion open plywood air vapor barrier that's visible just above. Um, so over the years, um, we've done a bunch of what I would consider major retrofits and a few um, deep retrofits. We've done foundation insulation projects, exterior roof insulation upgrades, interior attic insulation upgrades, air tightness and ventilation upgrades, wall cellulose fill projects, and a few that I call almost deep retrofits because they didn't quite address every major component, but uh, we had planned for, for that to happen in the future. These were major insulation and system upgrades um, for all of these projects. Um, and we all, we used most of the passiveless principles, even though we didn't really know of them at the time to guide how we were doing these things. And when we learned of passiveless, we used those principles. So we've done five deep, what I would call deep retrofits where every component of the building assembly and occupant comfort and, and health was considered. Um, I'll just list them very quickly and we'll get into some discussion about one in particular. So the farmhouse, uh, a two-story um, 1919 building that was moved onto the property and Larson Trust and full upgrades all around. New windows, doors, HRV, new basement, um, all of those things. Uh, Strathcona in the city, uh, uh, very similar. It was a 1912 two-story, and we did the same thing. New basement floor, new exterior basement insulation. Um, all systems upgraded. Uh, wall, Larson truss, uh, exterior attic insulation. Uh, 114 Arnold was a uh, bungalow uh, full retrofit. Uh, basement exterior in a, uh, insulation. Uh, wall, Larson Trust, new windows, doors, uh, the whole works, except for the basement floor. Keldonan Drive was the same to a story and a half. And 547 Montague, we're calling that the full Monty because it was the most complete retrofit that we'd ever done. Um, so that's what we're going to quickly run through here. So our retrofit method is fairly basic. Uh, it's three-eighths plywood, uh, a wood standoff to make space for cellulose and cellulose insulation. The original idea for the wall system, the Larson Trust, came from John Larson, <coughs> Edmonton, 1981. It still works well for retrofits. Uh, we establish a good air barrier and trace or design the continuity of it according to Passivos principles, the red line approach. Uh, in this, in the future, we would use Neopore GPS foam or Rockwell comfort board below grade uh, to reduce our embodied carbon. Um, other than that, we, until we can come up with something that is less expensive and easier to do, we would stick with this method. So we're going to go through this project in detail at speed 
we can have questions later uh but if there's anything i people will put it in the chat and we'll we'll carry on so front and back it's a wartime uh, story and a half uh very typical prototypical i would say and uh the, the couple that bought it were uh purposeful in purchasing the property and the building with the intent on retrofitting so go through sequence pictures the sequence doesn't matter as long as you have a plan for the rest of the systems we've found in our climate that the uh, ventilation and air sealing is important to get over with first because it's hard to address later so in this view we're actually completed the basement but uh, starting the roof so started in the basement a full basement floor removal and insulation upgrade the old partitions and uh, everything was removed from the basement and we started breaking up the floor uh, the conveyor is much better than hoisting pails loaded with rubble and dirt out of windows which we've done um, you can see some of the material that's going out the old clay weeping tile mud old wooden posts very typical of any older home this one was 1947. Um, we retained an amount of aggregate necessary to redo the floor with uh, aggregate so we kept as much as we could so recycled aggregate um, their concrete floor was in very poor condition and the drains were as well. That's why the floor went. Uh, here you can see new drain line and the furnace uh, hung in place above the work. The clients stayed in the building for the whole retrofit in this particular case. Um, we installed all new drainage and a new sump pit. The building had none at the time. Uh, so sealed uh, sump pit and drain leads. All the old cast plumbing drains were heavily corroded. Uh, the furnace drain in particular uh, was leaking under the slab, most likely from uh, condensation from the condensing furnace. It tends to be kind of caustic. Um, so all new plumbing and provision for full bath and everything in the basement. You can see the the rubble going back down so drainage through the footing the hung equipment as i said so we used the existing holes through the footing that connected to the old concrete clay tile that was exterior you can see the granular fill it's almost ready for foam there's the exposed footing the recycled aggregate piled the soil layer that needs to be removed to make room for insulation uh, nothing highly technical, just uh, work, labor. Um, some of the details, uh, we had to put the new uh, structural posts and pads in. So we wanted them to be thermal bridge free. So this particular one, as you can see, is lined with XPS. We do Neopore EPS, as I indicated. Um, we broke the edge of the slab or the edge of the footing rather um, and you can see just the recycled concrete base aggregate. We use geotextile to protect the poly radon uh, vapor barrier from the aggregate from getting punctured. So details of how we attach the uh, radon vapor barrier at the wall uh the, it had uh, a copper water service so we left that and the sealed tin mill poly sub slab moisture radon barrier we we're using ambicol tape for this project it was pretty decent uh, so we tap conned and caulked our uh, poly tin mill poly to the wall and then we backed that with uh, a wooden um, to keep the joint solid and you can see the line of foam that's going to thermally break the slab, the new slab from the walls. Here's the reinforced slab ready for concrete. The client is a retired civil engineer, so he wanted a reinforced slab. It's thermally broken at the footing and floor. There's two four-inch layers of XPS foam. It's R40, but very high in body carbon. So 
we replace it with something different now. New plumbing, complete with the black flow preventer, new foundation and slab drainage, new sump pit, the upgraded structural report. And uh, this floor is warm in your sock feet. So once the basement work was complete, they moved to the exterior. Um, as I said, the sequencing doesn't really matter as long as you plan for the next stages or if they can't, if the client maybe can't afford or the building isn't suitable or isn't ready for the next stage, as long as you plan so that your current work doesn't impede future work like this. So one of the things that we like to state is you just have to remember that water runs downhill. So you have to plan for the continuity of your air vapor barrier and your weather barrier. Uh, you have to plan for logistics of access and the availability of labor. In this case, you can see the dormer roof and wall install showing the, the trusses that are making space for in, new insulation. You can see the OSB air vapor barrier without the tape. And you can see the flap tie par at the roof ready to connect to the uh, Larson trusses that will build the walls, the sides of the dormer out. And the tie par at the old dormer eave is to keep any moisture uh, melting into and ingressing at the exposed joint in behind the stucco. So that's just for weather protection. The other side, you can see the completed Larsons, the completed tape joints, the OSB air vapor barrier, uh, and the new spacers with netting, which helps to control cellulose density when we come to blow it. So in this, uh, the roof on the north side is complete. Um, so we use metal roof on all of our projects because it's recyclable at the end of its life. Uh, the fascia and soffit have to wait for the walls. Now, in theory, the walls or the roof sections here could be prefabricated offsite and installed. Um, at this stage, the logistics of it were beyond us. Um, there'd be some fastening issues. I'm sure there are engineering solutions available. Um, so that roof is on and the scaffold is up on that side of the building. So you leave the scaffold there and you start stripping the stucco. Uh, you can see moisture damage uh, as well as areas uh, showing the complete lack of insulation in the walls. There was a foil faced craft paper. Uh, the, the shiny side was out. And I think it was intended as a vapor or a radiant barrier of some sort. Uh, the stud cavity was insulated with blown cellulose after we rewired or installed new wiring as necessary and repaired any structural issues uh, resulting from moisture. Then you switch sides, you know, either move around the building or in this case, we went, they went to the opposite side to complete the roof. So we'll repeat on the south side, uh, then the gable end walls. Basically you wanted to minimize the scaffold moves. Uh, Insulating and air sealing the wall and the roof um, improved interior conditions markedly because we were actually insulating the walls and uh, air sealing. Some of the work uh, was contingent on what conditions were found under the stucco, like how much uh, insulation there was that we hadn't planned on blowing because the client thought that there was some insulation in the walls, uh, but there wasn't. And uh, yeah. So, you can see the south side showing new wiring and the completed roof. Less moisture damage, I think, because of the drying opportunity on the south side. After the walls had plywood and tape put on them, um, so after the wiring, the cellulose and the stud cavities and the air vapor barrier insulation, we started in the foundation exterior insulation. Um, so waterproofing, drainage, air sealing two by four inch layers of XPS, same issue again, the high global warming potential. Water protection for the, uh, the uh, foam, in this case, 10 mil poly again, and the frost skirt, which you can't see. Uh, also not shown is two loops of 5 8 PEX pipe that we installed uh, prior to backfilling for the sub slab uh, HRV preheat Cool the subsoil heat exchanger. Uh, 
we installed that above the frost skirt, which proved to be too shallow for the long cold winters. Uh, we believed at the time that putting it under the frost skirt, which was is a, a layer of foam horizontally at, on top of the gravel that's visible in the right picture, um, we believe placing it there would cool the footing off or freeze it, but we would have just been recovering heat from the concrete walls because we can't insulate under the footing. Lessons learned. Um, the old basement windows were left in place until we replaced uh, or were ready to replace with new. Um, one of the things that uh, can be done is the basement windows can be slightly oversized because the old wooden bucks that were necessary interior to the concrete uh, can be removed, creating a bigger rough opening uh, and the window uh, buck or the, wind, the plywood window box is fastened to the concrete wall. So once the foundation is insulated and protected, then we do the Larsons on the wall. And uh, in this case, we started on the north side. You can see Larson trusses and window box installation. You have to have a build out for the window boxes for air tightness, for um, keeping the cellulose out, and, and to provide a place to install your new windows. Um, then we install a wood fiber board sheathing. Uh, we have switched to a non-asphalt coated wood fiber board. It's just neutral wood color, less smelly and toxic and all those things. This product is vapor open. It has a very slight insulating value and it's holding the cellulose in place. That's its main job for us. Uh, the vapor open is a requirement as well, but that's all it's doing for us is holding that cellulose in place because we're blowing it in under a certain density, three and a half pounds per cubic foot. And then you repeat around the building. Um, at the end, we uh, install Typar as the secondary air barrier and a weather barrier, uh, and then uh, in this case, one by strapping for a drying cavity and an attachment for cladding. Uh, in this case, it was one foot centers because the stucco contractor requested that on diagonal for drainage. So that's, the, I guess that's the insulation part. Um, we're gonna talk about insulation and thermal bridging. We're gonna talk about windows and doors very quickly. We mount our windows in the middle wall insulation to maximize the thermal performance of the frame, trying to help the frame in the cold. So um, this is a single layer of foam. We add a second and that's where the window sits is in that second layer of foam. Uh, our plywood boxes, this is a basement one, but our, all of our boxes are over insulated on the interior with rock wool. Looks like this. That's the over insulation detail. The upper windows have a slope sill and the rock wool cladding to protect the rock wool insulation. The details vary a bit. This maximizes window performance, breaks the thermal bridge of the plywood window box, helps that window perform as well as it can in the cold. There's a window box uh, prior to being covered up with the tent test or the wood fiber board. And you can see the rough. Uh, the first layer of stucco, the metal mesh, the metal sill pan in this case, and the rock wool. You can also clad it on the sides with metal, which we do frequently. There's ducts and windows we, we use. Uh, these are all uh, stucco returns. So it's the verticals and the top are gonna be stucco. There's the base coat. And there's another, on this particular building, it had a metal returned up in the gable end. So we're just trying to maximize the performance of the window, putting it in the warm layer if you can, adding drainage because water runs downhill, lapping our joints, um, using high quality windows. These are, you know, there's lots available. We, we've selected ours for various reasons. Um, so, Windows doors are a side issue, which we can discuss at the end if we wish. There's there's issues with high quality doors in North America. Um, so 
talk about air tightness and ventilation. Uh, when you make a building airtight, you have to have high quality uh, ventilation and it has to have heat recovery. Um, this result shown isn't for this particular project. It was around 0.42. Uh, that was for a new build, but we can achieve very good results, air tightness results with this method on retrofits. So the method's consistent and verifiable. So as I said, we need uh, superior mechanical ventilation. What do we try and use? We've been using local in some cases. Uh, the ventilation for passive house, you have to have 75% efficient or better and very low power consumption. Um, hard to find in some cases. In passive house, like the strict passive house, they want to supply heat with the HRV air, but that's really difficult to do here in our climate. And we haven't been able to bring it off with, with good results. We do want to keep the HRV from freezing up or going into defrost mode as much as possible. And that's why we use the subsoil heat exchanger. Uh, there's one, this, a homemade, I guess I'd call it, or, or contractor made version on the left above the Vanny 90 HB ECM. And uh, we've used the Vanny 2400 gold in both HRV and uh, ERV mode. And they're about 80% efficient. Um, we've also used uh, Zender HRVs. They're a, a Swiss um, make. They are rated a little bit higher. They also cost more. Uh, they don't have the same defrost strategy as um, North American HRVs. So we always use a, a subsoil heat exchanger with the Zenders. It uses a low wattage pump plastic pipe in the ground as I discussed on the retrofit need the more pipe in the ground the better at least 300 feet if you can uh, by creating input and output loops you can have separate circuits for pulling heat out of the ground and putting heat into the ground during the heating season so you get some pre-cooling in the summer and preheat in the winter or the supply or fresh air coming into the HRV from outside and at minus 40, every little bit that you can keep the machine or say minus 30 from going into defrost is beneficial because it's then providing ventilation, not defrosting or not using energy to defrost, which uh, translates to performance and efficiency. Uh, another thing to note is the cold side ducts in passive hose have to be well sealed and insulated with a vapor tight membrane to prevent condensation. Uh, we found that this uh, Neopore GPS foam ducting, there's a couple of different manufacturers. This stuff is from Zender called Comfo Pipe. It's ducting insulation and air tightness in one product, and it's very useful for cold side um, projects on HRVs. I, we use it as much as we can for that particular case. You can also use solar preheat. This is on my house. It uh, is low cost, very effective when it's working. Uh, in cold winter days, it can raise the intake temperature 10 to 15 degrees. And that makes a difference because then our HRV works as a ventilation unit longer rather than just trying to defrost. And eventually I did put cladding and a new roof on. So the HVAC is kind of our the next logical step. Uh, in our previous retrofits, we use straight electric radiant heat, baseboards and radiant panels. They're 100% efficient, they're simple, they're reliable, and they're low cost. But they don't offer any cooling. And uh, there are more efficient uh, electric heat units available, air source heat pumps, uh, ground source heat pumps. Um, with climate change, we need cooling because as the summer evenings are no longer cool enough to reduce the building temperature, you need some sort of mechanical cooling. We could go straight cooling, but the various heat pumps offer that efficient heating as well. So the higher performance air-to-air -air heat pumps from Mitsubishi or Daikin, and there's others on the market, uh, you can potentially leave 
the existing ductwork from the old furnace in place and install a lower capacity um, heat pump furnace or air handler. Um, then the ventilation air can be dumped directly into that air handler, the ventilation air from your HRV, which you have to install or you should. Um, this particular unit went into the farmhouse retrofit uh, this past fall, so no more burning of wood. Uh, you can also use mini split uh, HRV or uh, mini split heat pumps if uh, the building is well insulated enough and des and w and designed for it. Um, all of our retrofits have deleted natural gas burning equipment. Um, some of the newer uh, projects we're looking at heat pump uh, hot water tanks. They're very efficient. Um, there are heat pump units that use CO2 as a refrigerant, which further decreases the global warming potential of the systems. The, the refrigerant in these units has a relatively high global warming potential. So, and this unit in, in particular will operate down, it'll produce heat down to minus 30. Once you've completed your retrofit, uh, you show it off. Duxton Windows, in this case, hosted an event in 2017, bringing Martin Holiday from Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor up for a presentation on sustainable buildings. So we got to show them a couple of our projects. Uh, but what I found interesting was uh, he retired from Green Building Advisor in 2019, and they did an exit interview. And they asked him this question, what has pushed the green building movement forward the most in the last 40 plus years? That's a tough question to answer. Honestly, I don't think the res don't think residential construction in North America is very green, and I can't see signs that it is moving forward. Now, uh, my uncle's here; one of them's deceased, and Martin. They're all older than I am, and it was a little when I found out that that's what he was that was his mindset. It was a little a little discouraging. However. Groups like ours, are, are like our co-op and there's others, I, they're fighting the good fight, but we are such a small player in this game that uh, I think change is necessary. Um, Peter Amarongan from Retrofit Canada recently presented details of the Sundance Deep Energy Retrofit to Sustainable Buildings. Uh, it was called a peer approach, the Panelized Energy Efficient Retrofit. I think it represents uh, a really good approach, some of the best approaches for retrofits at scale. This is just a Google image. Um, there's also the Recover Initiative based in Nova Scotia, excellent example of retrofits at scale. And of note is their guiding principles of carbon reduction, equity, uh, it's open source and, and they try to be local. I believe that these approaches are great for what they are, um, but I don't think they're enough and and uh, provide some some background um i've seen various versions of this pie chart uh representing how much energy or or uh greenhouse gas the building sector produces it's a large it's a significant chunk um we have to also take account uh, of the transport uh, and the industry that takes place to build the materials or to make the materials that we use. Um, the building industry, I feel, we can technically attain the performance necessary for high performance retrofits. Um, there's lots of examples. The reality is it's expensive and it's out of reach for most single family dwelling homeowners and a lot of building owners. Um, I don't see a way to drive the process cost down to the point where it's affordable for the average homeowner. We know that as a society, we need to retrofit at scale to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions. And we also have to adapt to a rapidly and unpredictably changing climate. So the two things are different, but they're related. Um, kind of leads us into what I thought this was funny, but uh, the elephant in the room with embodied carbon. Um, we can't net zero energy our way out of embodied carbon. It just doesn't work. 
um, embodied carbon in many high performance retrofits, ours included, has locked in emissions that will take us closer to the, the, catast the catastrophe 2050 if we don't do something. Uh, like the, as I said, our projects have done the same using foam and concrete. So we need to do better and we need to do better immediately. In case you uh, weren't aware, embodied carbon is the emissions associated with the harvesting, transportation, manufacturing of building materials. These emissions occur before the building begins operation. Um, and it represents the majority of the emissions that will occur between now and 2050. This is from the Endeavour Centre and, and from Architecture 2030. Um, so between now and 2050, most of the emissions are coming from materials and construction, assuming that we're building uh, relatively efficient buildings. Chris Magwood presented these uh, slides at Passive West Canada uh, conference, and I thought they were interesting to view, um, showing the locked in emissions with a high performance build that's uh, the R20, 30, 40, 60 is uh, under slab, uh, basement walls, main walls, and attic. Uh, two slides, one the top is always showing natural gas heat, the bottom is with an electric heat pump. So you can see that the baked in emissions of almost uh, 90 or over 90 tons is always there if you go with materials that are high embodied carbon. But um, you can choose to go with a high performance natural build. In this case, this is one of the Endeavor Center's like full on high performance natural build that stores uh, almost nine tons of carbon when you go with heat pump, uh, electric heat pump heat. So all the way to 2050, you have a carbon credit because the building is storing carbon in the structure and the materials used and you haven't use materials that emit a lot of carbon. So that's important to note, it can be done. Now, this is the interesting thing is that this model building was constructed with off the shelf materials that are low carbon, uh, mostly wood and mostly cellulose and re recyclable materials. And at 2050, we're still on the positive side of the carbon equation. So that means that at 2050, the building is not yet emitting uh, carbon from the embodied carbon in the build. So it's necessary to do some research into what insulations have very low embodied carbon. And there's lots of methodologies out there. Um, they all basically lead you to the same conclusion. Anything that's plant-based has a very low embodied carbon compared to most other insulations. So on this list, it's cellulose. Um, there's all sorts of analysis showing what the optimum sort of insulation is. Um, blown cellulose is difficult to see on this graph. It's, there's a lot that's going on in the, in the, the tiny lines at the bottom. This is total carbon over 30 years per R value with the electric heat pump. And so greenhouse gas emissions on the vertical and how much insulation you add on the horizontal. Now, some of the insulations, um, if you add more than a few inches, uh, you're increasing your, global, your greenhouse gas emissions because they're so terrible and things are off gassing. Um, they're trying to change that with most of the foams and products like that. Um, but in terms of environmental impacts, uh, plant-based, in this case, cellulose uh, has a bunch of benefits. It's the only by, uh, insulation on this list that is made of natural fibers whose source can regrow using solar power. Uh, it is the cheapest of the plant-based insulations. I, I mean, things like wood fiberboard, uh, hempcrete, uh, and sheep's wool, uh, a lot of them are much more expensive to integrate into uh, a regular retrofit at scale. Um, in theory, cellulose in Canada could be sustainably harvested from our forests. Um, it, I don't think it is currently. Uh, Sun Certified uses cellulose fiber that is 
100% post-consumer, uh, recycled and locally produced, which contributes positively to the local economy. So there's other considerations besides just the insulating value. Now, some of the, the issues I see. Um, we've seen the incremental improvement rebates. We've seen the case studies and we've seen the pilot projects for high performance buildings, new or retrofits. Um, the building industry reinvents the wheel all the time for somebody to make money uh, by keeping it as proprietary. Um, but there are excellent examples of high performance retrofits and new builds in every province and territory and in many, many countries. Um, I don't think we need another case study. This graph is global emissions from fossil fuels and industry. Um, they don't include land use change. There's a little bit of difference that occurs, but not much. Um, the second graph is the same fossil fuels from emissions from industry and industry. Um, but since I was born in 1973, um, it isn't going down. Um, any of the reductions that have happened tend to coincide with economic slowdowns or downturns. And more recently, the uh, slowdown caused by the pandemic. But don't worry, we've rebounded. We're now beyond our uh, 2019 uh, low. Um, government actions to reduce carbon emissions have had very little effect globally. Um, lots of countries and smaller jurisdictions have reduced carbon emissions to some extent. So there are good examples like city of Vancouver, some jurisdictions in the EU, but this line keeps going up. For the building industry, it's an indication to me, this is just me talking, that we're, something's not working correctly. We're doing something wrong because the global emissions, despite all of the talk, despite all of the programs that we have in place, keep going up. Um, I think that that something is how we're doing our economy, how we are creating civilization. <laughs> it's a pretty big thing. I think we have to radically reorganize how we do this so that the line can start going down um, fully. But I, you know, that's why I like to present that these things. It's a chance to hear people discuss what can we do. Um, I don't know. I don't know how. I do know that uh, we think we know what to do for buildings. We need to retrofit. Um, I think we know that we need to retrofit at scale. Um, the peer methodology, uh, energy sprung in Europe. Uh, I think those are great, great starting places. It's, it's what we need to be moving towards. But how do we apply it uh, to Winnipeg um, without massive changes in how we're doing things? So some questions I'm gonna put out there is Manitobans like you and I, or maybe folks from outer province, we spent billions in hydro infrastructure projects. Could we have better spent that on a province-wide retrofit scheme? Um, the return on investment uh, from these sorts of retrofits is usually very high. Um, small groups like ours, uh, larger groups like Retrofit Canada, Pacifist Canada, Recover, um, can act as leaders and advocates and teachers or at Sustainable Buildings Manitoba, I have to include on the list. But is that enough without a major government involvement in how we um, move forward? Um, so how do we change the direction of the building industry to be carbon uh, positive? Um, that's, that's, my, that's my question. I, I think we know how to solve the, I call them the technical or practical issues of retrofits. Um, I just think that we need to answer some of these other questions so that we can get to the next stage, which is at scale. So yeah, those are, that's the end of my presentation. So uh, thank you for your time. I would like to thank SBM for hosting this and uh, 
to open it up to questions and comments. Thank you uh, so much, Donald, for this presentation. I can see uh, people really appreciating it in the chat. Um, so there are a few questions that have come in, so I'm just going to read some of them out. And then if you're interested in asking more questions, uh, you can raise your hand. Well, William, why don't we start with you? You've hands right up right now. Do you want to unmute and share? Yeah, thanks. Um, incredible slides, Donald. The um labor involved is impressive. So I'm just wondering, have you or any of your partner contractors with all that labor going on in the basement um, thought about eliminating the windows and using light wells so that you're essentially flood proofing the building, no fibers, no, no permanent textiles, um, because we've in Winnipeg had a lot of water, you know, last Spring, and that was unprecedented. So I'm just trying to figure out sort of the resilience, the deep resilience that you can add on to your deep retrofit for energy. It, the flooding issue in the Red River Valley is definitely an issue. Um, I guess like on our newer builds, we don't do basements for that issue or for that reason rather. Um, I guess people want that space right we're doing we're spending all this money and so we're tr a lot of the flooding basement flooding yes can come from windows um but it's more lack of drainage the buildings over you know some of these buildings have been around since the the 1910s and the ground around them has changed because of the amount of landscaping and things like that so we try to regrade when we do this so that the water is running away. And that is one of the most important aspects of any uh, moisture management is get the water away. Uh, uh, I say it all the time to new people with us or people that I meet who look at what we're doing and that's water runs downhill, uh, even though it's very flat. So we haven't really looked at eliminating the windows because if people wanna add a basement or a workspace, they want natural light and they also in some cases, you require egress. So, all I hope right, that answers your question. Well, I got we got a thumbs up, so it looks like you did. <laughs> um, so, the next question is coming in: is what are the pre-retrofit and post-retrofit ERs if ERS evaluations are done? ERS. Um, okay, we have had some of our retrofits evaluated. You'll have to tell me what ERS is. I. I've been looking at my own jargon for so long that- uh, uh, The Energuide uh, rating. Oh, Energuide ratings. Uh, they vary because we don't, like in some of our older ones, we weren't putting in heat pumps, uh, sub ground source heat pumps, which jumped the Energuide rating up. They were in the 84, 86 range, but that was the same for our new build. So it was kind of, kind of moot until we started going with heat pumps uh yeah the air tightness and the insulation upgrades uh didn't seem to matter as much prior all of these buildings were terrible like leaky above five for air changes things like that yeah okay uh the next question is could you provide any information about the time scope for retrofitting works and has the owner moved for a period of the construction work. And can you try and talk a little bit louder this time for this response? Uh, sorry. Um, timeline, the major, like the, the deep energy retrofit to 547 Montague took basically a full year. Um, we, at the time, didn't have the capacity to be doing some of the stages concurrently. Some crew could have been working in the basement while some crew could have been doing the roof. Uh, we're a small operation, so we didn't have the skilled labor available to do so. The client in all of our retrofits have stayed in the building. Um, one of them did, like we, I don't call it a retrofit because we added a high performance second story to an existing building. That client also stayed in the building. That was challenging, very challenging. But um, most of the work takes place on the exterior of the building. The window replacement is a window by window thing that only is minutes where there's no window in the building. 
So we try and minimize that impact. Um, the HVAC is often in the basement, which uh, is separate at least from the living space in a lot of cases. So I think that hey, was the question. Uh, thank you. So how difficult will it be to replace windows in the distant future? And again, just a little bit more volume. Oh, I'm gonna be yelling here, Laura. Um, the glass can be replaced. Uh, you pop the stop and put a new glass unit in. Um, the windows themselves, uh, the fiberglass framed windows should last a long, long time. Um, probably if you wanna change one of our windows, you're gonna to have to remove some drywall. I didn't unmute. unmute. Got it. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm interested in learning more about things to look for slash consider when purchasing a house. If you attend to retrofit, if you intend to retrofit to the, a house. So what are some things you should look for? Uh, simple form factor. Uh, so square boxy is good. I think Volvo. Uh, the more complicated the building shape, the more expensive it is to retrofit because corners cost money. Um, it has to have some sort of contiguous foundation. We've retrofitted limestone rubble foundations, but they're difficult, a little bit more difficult, but they're doable. Um, a good poured concrete foundation is easier to deal with. Uh, you want some solid beamage so that you don't have to upgrade too much structural because that gets very expensive very quickly. So make sure that you have a structural engineer in before you buy the house so that you don't choose a house that needs a whole crap ton of structural upgrades if you want to retrofit. Um, I would consider buying into a townhouse that has multiple units so that you can achieve uh, scaled savings at some point the whole unit could be transformed or the whole building that that would be my my take on it uh anything else laura yeah so somebody's asking about yeah somebody's asking about the total cost per square foot of a particular retrofit from that you were discussing uh, that one was approaching at the time, like 240 something dollars a square foot. It's like, it was a total recapitalization of that building. It was wrapping the old building in a new building. So that client was motivated and, uh, uh yeah, it's a lot of money. It, it's not cheap. It just isn't. That's one of the issues that we need to discuss. Um, totally. Okay, moving on to the next one. So how, uh, what is, well, guess what the cost is to the original dwelling? Do you want to expand on costs anymore? Or? Uh, I, we never actually inquired about the cost of that original home because we knew it was quite high. That lot in particular is in a very nice neighborhood. So I would imagine that at the time, which would have been 26, 2015, um, it would have been less than it is now, but it would have been a lot. So they probably spent that much again, I'm willing to bet. Like it's expensive It's uh, to do this on a single family dwelling basis, unless you can do it yourself, which a lot of people don't have the technical or the time, um, it just is expensive. And there's no getting around that we can't afford to just shell out money to do this. So it's going to have to be, but we have to do it. So what has to give? That's the question I'm asking. The technical part I can talk about all day, but that's the question I'm putting out to the, to the people in policy and government and architects and engineers is how do we make this work at scale uh, without everybody having, like there's money out there, millions and trillions. If somebody can buy, Twitter for whatever it was. There's money available to do this. Sorry, let's go on to questions. <laughs> All right. So um, just a question about homeowners exploring solar, uh, renewable on the roofs. Uh, and was it feasible on a steep roof? 
Oh, yes, totally feasible on roofs like this. Um, it's, it's again, a, just an additional expense, but it, for that particular project, it would be net zero in a, in an instant. I think if, the, I think the energy, I think they need eight or nine kilowatts and that would probably get them there. Uh, it's not a very big house though. So, and they didn't want to cut the trees down on the south side. So if you don't want to cut down your trees, you're not going to get as much output. So. Makes sense. Um, so we're just chat stuff. Yeah, there's some good conversations going. So we've got a few more questions. Obviously, it's one o'clock. If people have to go, that's totally understandable. Donald, do you mind staying and trying to answer a few more? I have Away some we time, yeah. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so coming in here, what are the possible changes in the building codes to get closer to mass adoption of energy management systems used by some certified projects? Uh, well, we'd need a step code in Manitoba. Let's say, take Manitoba. Uh, we need a step code similar to Vancouver's step code. More aggressive. I would go more aggressive. It's colder here. Um, so that would be the the path to take is to introduce a uh, incremental uh, changes to the code to give time for the industry to learn how to do it um but set a date set it soon and break it up into steps and then develop the path to get there it it can't be that hard because other jurisdictions have done it so it's not impossible it's just all of this stuff is us deciding to do it the guy yeah. so that's that's where that's what we need to do if we want to at least move as they often say, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a question here. Um, someone says, uh, I've never been a fan of poly polyethylene. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to embarrass myself worse than I just did. Air barriers. Uh, and I've seen webinars that compare the results to more robust barriers. And the results are not great for the film products. Have you looked at other types of air barriers? Have you done after install air leakage tests? Uh, yes, our main air barrier is taped plywood, tape 3 8 plywood. We use the uh, TIPAR, which is a spun bonded polyolefin um, with a coating on it for a weather barrier and a secondary air barrier. Uh, so the tape plywood is open diffusion, which means moisture can diffuse or move through it, depending on conditions on either side. Uh, and we do usually about three air tightness or air leakage tests during our retrofit process. One pre, one as soon as we have the tape plywood in, in place, if there's still windows and doors to find leaks. And then we do sometimes more for diagnostic purposes. And then we try and get it third party tested at the end, or we do our own and see where we're at. So yes, um, yeah. All right. Uh, along the same topic, are you familiar with aerosol pressurized air sealing process slash, slash technology that seals the whole house in hours? I've heard of it. Uh, we saw the process sort of happening at one of the habitat builds that uh, um, Prairie uh, Building Performance was involved with um, on one of the sustainable buildings tour, I believe, I thought. Um, yeah, they were doing those buildings. They were foam insulated. Yeah, it achieves incredible results. Just more plastic. I'm not a big fan of the plastic in the home, especially aerosolized plastic. But that, I'm sure that they have um, done a bunch of research on it. Um, I just think the more plastic we use, the further down that particular path we're going to go. And I think we have to change from away from fossil fuel related or originated products or we're not going to achieve the carbon uh, reduction that we need probably quieting as uh, as i go yeah excuse me this is daniel i i don't i don't disagree um at all donald at the same time if you um there's a good picture on the link that i sent so it's uh the classic sort of 75 year old house actually next to me where they did a 
a complete remodel and everything was kind of down to the drywall. And uh, they put this machine inside and they, I mean, yep. if you if you do your ceiling, then you're putting silicon or other, you know, other kind of stuff in the air, et cetera. But it was incredible. Um, I've been in this business for years. I've never seen a ceiling technique as efficient and effective uh, because it simply follows the air out of the house. It seems really cool. Yep. Yeah. Uh, like I say, I, I think if we could come up with a method that doesn't use plastic. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Maybe cellulose based. <laughs> Maybe cellulose based. Uh, would you talk about permitting and inspections needed to complete these types of projects? Uh, at the beginning, we had some interesting conversations with the authority having jurisdiction, in this case, the city of Winnipeg. Um, most of the stuff that we do is laid out in the old code, the 2010 code that we're operating under. So we just use the information in the code, uh, try and present that to the authority having jurisdiction. And once they understand what they're looking at, we've had few issues since. Um, inspections, uh, we're not, most like the trusses, the rafters themselves, like for the roof are pre-engineered. Uh, the Larsons, we usually, or the walls, we usually have an engineered stamp on the drawing submitted to the city. Uh, that's not an issue. Um, inspections, it's not a structural component, so they don't even want to see the Larson trust process. Uh, the plumbing and electrical and all that is standard inspection. Um, yeah, not really an issue anymore. Okay, well, that seems to be all of the questions there in the chat. So, and I don't see any hands up. So, uh, oh, wait, wait, there's something that just came in. I spoke too soon. Here we go. Have you come across uh, or performed your own study on two scenarios? One is building running as usual, so no retrofit causing operational carbon and, and energy cost, versus same building retrofitting causing embodied carbon and capital cost plus reduced operational cost. What is the time frame for achieving carbon and cost break even? So, no, we haven't done that sort of uh, analysis. I'm sure somebody has. And mm -hmm. the um, generally, the total cost of building ownership results show a payback, like the CIFAR analysis. So, we, I, I trust that output. Uh, the business as usual. Um, still have to ca count the embodied carbon uh, there as well. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the time frame for achieving carbon and cost break even. I don't talk cost break even anymore because there's no spending $275,000 on your building. Um, where is that going to break even? Uh, it's a total recapitalization. Um, it means that you're investing in the building for beyond your lifespan. Um, people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on other things in buildings rather than retrofits. And there's no payback on those. There's no payback analysis on any of those uh, renovations. So I don't think it's, we know that we have to do this. So we, it, the cost analysis is how do we figure out how to inject the capital into the system to the point where we can do it at scale. That's the analysis that's necessary. The comparative stuff has already been done and it's not worth doing anymore. In my opinion, uh, comparative analysis is not uh, all that helpful anymore. All right, uh, so. Sense. Jay has heard anecdotally the cost of aerosol is quite high. Could the same air tightness results be achieved with well-timed blower door tests to identify and address leakage areas? Uh, it, the way the aero seal works is, as, as uh, uh, Daniel said, is pretty interesting because it, it finds gaps and starts filling them by the the or the the uh, particles adhering to each other. Um, with a diesel blower door running and um, 
somebody who's experienced, you can find a lot of leaks, but you can't get at the stuff that that tiny particles can get at. Um, so you can do a lot. You just can't do what that system does. Um, so not the same. Uh, we run the blower door when we're when we're ready to to diagnose leaks in the building, and so we can get down to 0 0.3 and things like that, which is not not. I know they have gone lower with the aero ceiling, but it's pretty good, uh, and it's probably a, a lot to do with the doors because a lot of the times you can't seal the doors up because they're so terrible. Okay, any final thoughts you just want to throw out there, Donald? Uh, no, I'm just glad for the opportunity. I hope I wasn't too preachy. I know I can get, uh, like, I can talk for hours about technical stuff. Like, watching um, Peter Amaranjan, like, I know we're small potatoes here. Uh, we have a, a lot of experience with single family dwellings, but that's not going to make the difference that we need to make. But the technical ca or uh, practical part is doable. That's not the issue. <laughs>